had so many so many new subscribers to our mailing list i don't even know the numbers at this point but we've grown i think by like five or six times than what we were before and that all is shown by and all of this engagement within our global community is shown in the fact that we received over 900 applications for the YLYP's Young Feminist Awards. I mean, it was such an incredibly humbling and privileged experience to be able to take just a quick peek at the incredible work being carried out by young leaders across the globe. And it was also very hard to make a decision about our finalists, but we are so excited to announce them, to meet them virtually, and I won't hold us back any longer and turn it over to Devin and Safira to move us forward. Thank you, Saida. My name is Safira. I'm also serving as one of the co-chairs of the YLYP program. Um, and so we've been very lucky to partner actually with an amazing organization called Women Have Wings to be able to have these Young Feminist Awards this year. And, you know, as 2020 and now also in 2021, we're marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action. It's, it's very timely in a way to think about how we are supporting young activists and those who are doing really outstanding work for gender equality on the ground. So this, this wonderful partnership has allowed us to be able to make some, some grant money available. Um, and I just wanted to pause here to acknowledge Eliza. And I don't know if Krini is on the call, just to say thank you so much for this wonderful partnership and, and what, what this has allowed us to do. Um, so we have five winners, which Devin is going to announce. Um, but we also want to recognize 20 runners up. So these are kind of those who didn't quite make the winners, but who we felt were really outstanding, um, you know, applications and the work on the ground is also very impactful. So we want to give the opportunity to give them a little bit of publicity that maybe others on the call or other organizations might find worthwhile in also funding um, some of their, their ideas and initiatives. But we have these um, awards that five winners will be getting grant money of $5,000 each to help with um, seed money for an idea that they've had on the ground or to help advance a process that they already have underway. So we're so excited to have um, all of you on the call to kind of um, hear a little bit about the work that these winners are doing and just to celebrate this past year of the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals program. And I'll hand over to Devin. Hi everyone. Of course, as soon as I need to speak, my cat decides to interrupt. Um, hi everyone. So um, we're super excited to announce the winners, but just before we do that, I just wanted to give a little bit more background on what we were looking for in these awards um, and some of like the criteria. So we really wanted to highlight really truly youth-led, youth-driven projects and organizations, um, especially those um, who are more grassroots um, and really working within their communities, which Saida talked about a little bit. Um, so these five projects really, um, you know, met those criteria, um, along with being just like really unique, transformative and innovative ideas. So with that being said, I'm just going to quickly um, introduce the winners and then we'll hear from each of them. Um, so the first one we'll hear from today is the Agape Project from Global Girl Media Greece. Um, and it's focused on gender-based violence um, during the rise since COVID-19 um, and um, most acutely experienced by refugee women. Um, Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Did sorry, Andy, I'm actually just going to list everyone and then I'll give the floor to you. Sorry. Um, so the next one we have is Matrilineo, based in Puerto Rico. It's a grassroots trans feminist and anti-racist project of reproductive justice for menstrual awareness and the sustainability of safe spaces aimed at menstruating people and living with HIV. Um, the next is the Queer African Network based in Kenya. It's a queer owned social app and website for LGBTQ plus people of African descent to socialize, read queer stories and find safe opportunities. 
Um, the next one is the STEM Girls Initiative of um, the Age Network. Uh, it's a program specifically dedicated to empower girls and advance gender equality in girls' education in the field of STEM. And then last but not least, we have the For Her Initiative in Sierra Leone. And that project focuses on rural women in vertical farming for sustainable income. And with all that being said, I now like I now like to introduce Andy from Global Girl Media Greece. Go ahead, Andy. Hi, everyone. I am Andriana from Global Girl Media Greece. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. It means a lot to us. We're so glad. So Agape Project. Agape means love in Greek. So we are a group of both migrant and refugee girls and Greeks, of course, that we work together on gender-based violence. We want to highlight what are the challenges and the struggles that women from that live in Greek society faced during the COVID, but also generally with our rights. So we want to collaborate with other organizations, feminist organizations, and highlight what happens in society and what really happens to girls with that background. As you know, Greece is the country where the refugee crisis is a, our, is a main issue. So we want to train more girls in uh, media and audiovisuals so to start find fight through this way for their rights. And this is all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. That was awesome. So exciting. Um, so now I'll give the floor to Matrilineo, based in Puerto Rico. Hola, buen día. Eh, soy Laura Angelis, soy de San Juan, Puerto Rico. Eh, vivo en Santurce, soy una mujer joven, queer, negra, viviendo con VIH eh, desde que nací. Eh, actualmente estoy trabajando con Matrilinio. Matrilinio es un espacio seguro para personas menstruantes. Ahora mismo estamos en la distribución de mil copas menstruales eh, que fueron donadas por un proyecto que se llama Black Women Health Imperative. Eh, así que estamos distribuyendo copas menstruales fuera del área metropolitana donde el acceso es menor y donde todavía las comunidades que fueron afectadas por el huracán María en el 2017 eh, y por los temblores del año pasado, pues siguen ¿verdad? recuperándose. Eh, en adición a eso, estamos generando unas exhibiciones de sangrado libre eh, acerca de la menstruación. Voy a mostrar la promoción. Eh, es una exhibición de sangrado libre, donde las personas van a aprender, a dialogar sobre sus experiencias, a tomar charlas sobre la menstruación, sobre higiene menstrual, sobre cómo utilizar la copa, eh, y también damos talleres del autoexamen vaginal, eh, que lo utilizamos ¿no? como herramienta emancipadora de las mujeres, de autoconocimiento, exploración, sobre todo en estos momentos donde vivimos tanta violencia hacia las mujeres en Puerto Rico y en todo el mundo. Así que la oportunidad de tener esa herramienta para explorarse ¿no? y para tomar mayor control sobre la propia menstruación, que es algo que viene todos los meses, sobre todo en comunidades con poco acceso, con poco acceso a agua, eh, pues es muy valioso. Así que nos sentimos súper agradecidos de recibir esta subvención para poder seguir metiéndole y expandiendo el proyecto en todo Puerto Rico. Gracias. Thank you so much, Laurangelis. Um, Rosa is on the call. I'm not sure if maybe you can just do a quick um, synopsis um, in English for those who don't speak Spanish. Sure, I'll do my best. Um, Good morning. Uh, my name is Rolandes Tomas, 
and I am with Matrilineo, a grassroots trans feminist and anti-racist project of reproductive justice for menstrual awareness and the sustainability of safe spaces aimed at menstruating people living with HIV. I am a queer um, Afro descendancy um, living with HIV. Um, Matrilineo is distributing um, 1,000 menstrual cups um, with a project called Black Women's Health, um, primarily outside of the main uh, urban areas where people have been hit with um, natural disasters in 2017. There was uh, the hurricanes and also um, earthquakes that have impacted um, these communities. So we are working with them to try to um, rebuild um, these communities. We're right now um, starting a, um, a project, a campaign called um, uh, free bleeding. Um, uh, I think that might be the the right translation in, in English. Um, free bleeding, which is um, providing um, these menstrual cups um, in uh, uh, monthly uh, meetings. Um, so um, this is primarily to be able to provide um, people who have very little access um, to these uh, materials, um, especially in the rural areas um, and those um, living with HIV. So we're, we work to increase uh, menstrual empowerment um, um, between among menstruating people and menstruating people living with HIV in safe spaces for face-to-face -face menstrual awareness using art and exchange of ancestral knowledge as a tool. So I'm, I'm super, super happy to be here today um, with all of you. Thank you so much for this award um, and on behalf of the people of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Rosa and Lorangelis. Um, the next um, winner is the Queer African Network. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Okongo Kinyanji. I go by he and his. And I work as one of the co-founders and executives of the Craft Network. And my name is Nerima He De She, and I am a director of Spotlights and one of the co-founders for Queer African Network. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to share our screen real quick and put it on full screen. Um, yeah. So we're really excited about this opportunity and to introduce Khan and just share this space with all of you. And so, yeah, this is our presentation. And the Queer Africa Network, as Devin said, is a social and professional networking app for TLGBQI plus communities of African heritage to socialize, find opportunities, and access TLGBQI plus positive content. And we use queer to represent persons of diverse sexual orientations, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics, and African to refer to anyone who self-identifies as having African heritage. Yeah. yeah, and as Naima mentioned, CAN has three main segments. So the first one is publishing. And in December of 2020, we managed to um, publish three issues of our magazine, Amanda Magazine, Stories from East and Southern Africa. And that's the cover for the first issue. Uh, the second segment is the social segment. So we actually have 730 active users as of uh, June um, who uh, engage with each other um, from over 80 plus different countries. And the last segment of kind is the opportunity segment. And we have 2000 opportunities that have been vetted for safety for uh, TLGBQ plus um, applicants. And with the award that we received, thankfully we are now able to expand our capacity tenfold. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. So the problem that we're trying to, to solve or like to combat is that just like us in our individual lives, queer Africans experience 
extreme manifestations of discrimination like extortion and physical violence like rape and murder and, thing, and police brutality. And this violence really prevents queer Africans from living full lives as we're excluded from the social, economic and political day-to-day -day of our societies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the solution we're taking to address this is a technological approach to solve the daily prejudice that imposes isolation on our community by building an online network of queer stories, opportunities, and social connections. Yes. And yeah, and so this uh, these are the segments that we've talked about at Cannes. And we're just going to go briefly over like the three of them and uh, the impact that we've had so far since submitting our application. Um, so in terms of the users, we have 730 users. Users are, have been able to engage and message each other and create groups, uh, create weekly events, um, and even create matchmaking, uh, uh, engage in a matchmaking capacity. We've only had three requests for deletion, which shows us that users are appreciating uh, the space that we're providing. And you can see that on the next, on the testimonial to the right. Um, we noticed that 50% of our users feel safe enough to have their profile pictures, noting that many of our users come from countries where they're criminalized for same-sex intimacy. This is a huge feat for us because it also shows us that our platform is safe enough to have them uh, present. And with the opportunities, we have a rec opportunity recommendation program where each user gets tailored with the opportunities they're looking for so for scholarships and the field that they have and we also run a mentorship program where we attach queer africans with mentors to help them in their field and whatever they need mm -hmm. um and again with our books of pay what you can accessibility program so that not only are we creating positive content but positive content that is accessible to everybody and we're launching our marketplace, which we're so excited about, and with the funding to expand into that, where we'll have queer, different queer African businesses be able to make money directly from the work that they put in and connect with the audience that they intended to connect with. Yes. And that's artists, entrepreneurs, the whole nine. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, this is what we hope to achieve now with our award. So um, we intend to pursue registration, which can be quite, uh, quite a difficult process for a queer organization here in Kenya. Um, in November, we hope to have 30 businesses in our marketplace. In December, we hope to have published six books. And in April, we hope to hit 5,500 active users on our mobile platform. Um, and in June, we hope to have 500 matchmaking service subscriptions where people can connect and build meaningful connections with each other. Yeah. yeah and so thank you for sharing with us this space and this time and we're so mm -hmm. honored to receive this award that's going to help us just capacity mm -hmm. build and go further and provide more services for our community so we thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much queer african network another awesome initiative project um so next we will go to the stem girls initiative is anyone from the STEM Girls Initiative here to present? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, go ahead. Oh, you're go ahead. muted. Hello. 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 Yeah, good afternoon. I am Jay Abalan. How are you doing? I am, I am I, Jay Abalan. Yeah, my name is Tina from Afghan Girls of Bamak Network. Hello. 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 Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Um. My colleague is having technical issues and I believe she'll join us shortly. Hello. We can hear you, go ahead. Hello. Oh, oh fine, fine. Um, Isu Vivian Hello, is having um, issues. Yeah, I'm with you. Vivian is having some issues with her uh, uh, network. So she'll be joining us shortly. No problem. So meanwhile, we'll be sharing um, a short video of, uh, of, of our work in STEM girls with you guys. 
Okay. Um, sorry, everyone, just give me one second. Okay. STEM Girls Initiative H Network Program. H Girls Education. Girls Education seeks to break barrier and advance girls' rights to education. STEM Girls Initiative to advance gender equality and girls' education, particularly in the fields of science and technology. About STEM Girls Initiative Description Our STEM Girls Initiative seeks to improve girls and advance gender equality in girls' education, particularly in the fields of science and technology. The initiative lays a foundation for tomorrow's female medical doctors, female engineers, among others, and its programs aims to improve girls' academic performance, grades, and STEM subjects, and increase their enrollment in STEM majors in the tertiary institutions. Focus areas of STEM Girls program. First, STEM Girls School Club, a study group for girls to improve girls' academic performance in STEM subjects to increase enrollment of girls in STEM majors in tertiary institutions. Contact us to organize a STEM Girls Club in your school. Second, STEM Girl to STEM Women is a mentoring program for STEM girls. The program creates an opportunity for girls interested in STEM to access one-on-one -on -one career and educational support and counseling from women working in the field of STEM. Contact us to mentor a girl in STEM. Third, STEM Girls Talk Show is a virtual space for girls in STEM. The show enables girls and women to discuss the benefits and challenges of girls approaching STEM subjects. Contact us to join the show. STEM Girls Initiative. Why is STEM important? In the future, the majority of jobs will increasingly require STEM skills. Yet, considerably less girls than boys approach STEM. Reasons why girls do not pursue them. More men than women are in STEM job. Traditional societies do not encourage girls to join STEM. General disinterest and or lack of confidence. Not enough female role models in STEM fields. STEM Girls Talk Show, a virtual space for girls and women to discuss science, technology, engineering, and math. Join our virtual space or be our STEM Girls Talk Show presenter and engage female professional in a discussion in the fields of STEM. STEM Girls School Club, Partner with us to help form a study group for girls in your school or community to improve girls' academic performance in STEM subjects and increase your enrollment in STEM majors in tertiary institutions. Take action. Donate to support H Network STEM Girls Initiative. H Mission to empower, support, and protect young women and girls for a fairer future. Awesome. Um, did anyone from STEM Girl want to just follow up on that? Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, the organizers of this organization, of this great program. We, we are so excited to be elected as one among those great people doing this job. Uh, it's such an honor. So, um, this award, I want to say, is indeed a great push and support for our commitment yes. to respond to the um, UNESCO's call to bridge the under in divided in STEM. So um, I want to say thank you so much for organizing this occasion. 
it's it's quite a raw one and indeed it's great <clears throat> thanks elizabeth um all right then another really really cool initiative um, and then the last one we have, last but not least, is the For Her initiative, um, the Rural Women in Vertical Farming Project. So if anyone from the For Her initiative wants to come in here, that'd be great. Okay, so it looks like the For Her initiative um, isn't here. Maybe they're having connection issues. Um, so uh, I did post in the chat a couple times the um, uh, document with more information about the winner. So please, please feel free um, to read more there. Um, and I'll post it in the chat again in uh, just a moment. Um, and I also just wanted to say that we will be sending out another announcement um, through our mailing list uh, of the announcement of all the winners as well as the 20 runner ups um, too. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, we can move on to our next um, segment of the meeting. Um, Hootie, I don't know if you wanna jump in here. Of course I do. <laughs> I'm just so excited. Okay, first of all, Devin, you are amazing. Thank you so much for organizing, helping organize all of this. The winners are so freaking inspiring. I can't wait to see the runner ups as well. I want to thank Women Have Wings again for partnering with us over the last two, three years now. And each time we just like raise the bar. I don't know what we're going to do next. Maybe just take a break from all of this, but, but it's been amazing. So thank you all. Now, I, I mean, honestly, we could not have planned a better ending for our season than a program such as this to show everybody why it is so important to empower, to magnify, <clears throat> to amplify youth voices. And then at the same time, also hold space for our wise women, because we are all in this together. It is, we're, not, we're, we're hoping to really be as inclusive, as transparent, as collaborative, and as shared leadership model as we can. And today's meeting is actually a perfect example of that. So I wanna thank YLYP for everything that they've done. What they just showed us for the first 35 minutes now is just, mind-blowing what they have done in this past year is just inspiring so i don't even know what else to say but now i want to hand the floor over to our wise women susan o'malley and pamela morgan have put together an amazing panel sit back relax and learn what is happening with widows around this world and i'll be back at 10 a, 10 a.m new york city time to go over our business announcements. Susan, the floor is yours, my dear. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. We are pleased to end our 2021 year with this important topic of widows. The NGO CSW New York Executive Committees, committee members who host the monthly meetings are always invested in the meeting topics. However, Today's topic of widows is quite personal for my co-host, Susan O'Malley and me, as we have both lost our spouses and we both understand firsthand many of the issues affecting women. Author D. Doley recently wrote that widowhood is not a choice. It is an inevitable part of life. Hence, the problem is not with the status, it, it arises only when widowhood becomes a reason for the stigmatization and deprivation of women. There is the psychological aspect of widowhood. According to the UN Division for the Advancement of Women, 
widows through poor nutrition, inadequate shelter, lack of health care, and vulnerability to violence are very likely to suffer not only physical ill health, but stress and chronic depression as well. As an example of stress, please consider that in some, <clears throat> excuse me, that in some countries, women go from being called she to it when they lose their husbands. How does one deal with that? There are also secondary losses that accompany widowhood in some countries, such as the loss of financial security, the loss of identity, the loss of purpose of physical in intimacy, the loss of inner happiness. In other countries, the loss can be more extensive enforced by cultural, social, or legal bonds. Widows may experience human rights abuses, including banishment from their marital home, the loss of possessions, land, or even the loss of their children. COVID-19 has caused an explosion in the numbers of recent widows worldwide and the severity of issues that surround the loss. The good news is that women around the globe are beginning to fight back. Today, we will hear from women who are actively working to improve life for women who have lost their spouses. Please be sure to put your questions in the chat for our Q&A. I will now turn the program over to Susan O'Malley, who will introduce the speakers and moderate the discussion with our four esteemed panelists. Thank you, Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pamela, for that wonderful um, um, beginning introduction. First, I just have to say how inspired I am by the uh, young feminists. Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, I, I'm, they're so courageous, so smart. Um, anyway, what a way to start. Um, I hope we can um, uh, be as informative in all. Anyway, this is a very, very important program to us. Um, Pamela and I started talking about this last talk at an NGO CSW um, retreat. We put it on the calendar. Um, she said a lot of what I was going to say at the very beginning, but what I do want to say is that um, well, what, I, first I, sh I should say I'm outside. So if the birds get too loud or the planes, I will move inside. But it is the most beautiful day in Brooklyn and we don't always get days like this in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I think what is so upsetting to me that attention, we cannot, we have not yet got the intent, attention that we need paid to widows. There's no way the sustainable development goals are going to be fulfilled unless attention is paid to widows. That's, that's it. Um, uh, in my former life, I was an English professor and sometimes that comes back, but I don't know if you all know Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman. There's a line that was echoing in my mind this morning. Attention must be paid. Attention must be paid. And that's what I think in terms of widows, attention must be paid. And yes, we had more events on widows at CSW this year, which was wonderful. Um, but in the agreed conclusions, we fought so hard and we had so many mentions of widows and suddenly the last day they were all swept out. And so attention must be paid. Our first um, speaker, there will be a PowerPoint um, I hope um, uh, Marike is here. I didn't see her, but is, she's here, right? Yes, Susan, I'm oh, here. Good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, she's going to do a PowerPoint on basic information on widows and some of the work that the Global Fund for Women, I mean for widows, excuse me, has done. Uh, she is the program manager for Global Widows, the uh, fund for, sorry, Global Fund for Widows, where she leads the Global Fund for Widows UN advocacy in the General Assembly and also the Security Council, in addition to supporting program implementation. She has held research positions with UN Women and the US State Department. I, um, each speaker will have 10 minutes and then I'll introduce them uh, 
um, as each speaker um, comes on. Anyway, um, the floor is yours. I find that such a weird thing, the floor is yours on Zoom. Where's the floor? Um, but anyway, the floor or maybe the Zoom is yours. It is yours. Thank um, you so much, Susan. <laughs> Yes. I think, you know, that's a very sort of philosophical question to maybe tackle a little early on uh, for me in the day. Um, but thank you so much, Susan um, and Pamela, for really sort of spearheading the widowhood item um, for the NGO CSW. Um, I'm so excited to be here and I appreciate the invitation to speak. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, the issue of widowhood is particularly and tragically timely. Uh, as uh, mentioned, it really has been a widow maker uh, where we see men being affected or dying at a rate of two to one to women. Um, so uh, I don't know, Devin, is it easier if I run the PowerPoint or Perfect, thank you so much. Um, you know, for a lot of us, the first thing that we consider when we think about widows certainly is the grief and the stress of losing a spouse. And that is widely sort of recognized as one of the most stressful periods of a person's life. Um, but for so many women around the world, that is amplified by the risk of losing their income, their home, sometimes their children, their role in the community, as well as being at higher risk for a number of uh, human rights abuses that she may suffer. Uh, next slide, please. So at Global Fund for Widows, we advocate for the rights of widows within the international space, but we also believe in financial inclusion and economic empowerment. Um, which is really the foundation, we think, uh, to enable a widow's resiliency. And, you know, that's what I was asked to speak on today is that resiliency component. So I'm looking forward to outlining more about our experience, our programming, and our impact. For us, one of the big challenges that we find is defining a widow. There is the de facto widow, which is much, uh, what is most commonly accepted is that the husband is deceased. Uh, but we find that to be somewhat complicated across geographical contexts. In many cases, uh, a marriage is customary. There's no sort of formal paperwork associated, which complicates the question of who is a widow uh, upon the death of the partner. Sorry, could we mute them? <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next sort of category of widow that we look at is the functional widow. This is a case where the husband has abandoned uh, the woman voluntarily or involuntarily. Uh, it could be due to the impact of a state or non-state actor um, or for another reason such as economic migration. Um, and then the third category, which we have recently added, is the forced marriage widow. We mostly see this in conflict contexts. Uh, we like to say that this is the girl who woke up in the morning, went to school, and then was kidnapped and forcibly married to her abductors. Uh, when she returned to the community, we're so glad and relieved that that is able to happen. Um, but her reality is that she is viewed and by her community and by herself as being married to her captor. Um, so just another sort of interesting piece of widowhood that we need to discuss further within these international discussions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, just to give everyone a, scale, a sense of the magnitude of the issue, we have, uh, according to the most recent census data, which is now a decade old, uh, about 300 million widows globally. This does not count the women who were in a customary marriage and therefore aren't legally ever married or uh, widowed within the, um, the sphere of the law and uh, the legal context of uh, their country. Um, but this also doesn't take into account the conflicts of the past 10 years and now COVID. 
Um, so we really think that this is an underestimate of the sense of the magnitude that we have today. Um, as you can see, we've also listed a number of other um, vulnerable populations um, that we more actively see being spoken about in the international community in terms of the, the numerous rights abuses and uh, vulnerabilities that they have. And you can just see that there's a lot of uh, women who are sort of flying under the radar as we don't address widowhood. Next slide, please. So within the Global Fund for Widows Network, um, I just wanna highlight a couple of key pieces. Uh, first and foremost, when we think of a widow, um, I typically think of my grandmother. Uh, she, I think was the first sort of like widow that I understood as being a widow. Um, but for within our network, the women that we work with, um, that's definitely not the case. In Tanzania, 76% of our widows were widowed before the age of 29, and 99% were widowed before the age of 30. In Egypt, 53% of our widows are between the ages of 20 and 39. So these are actually very young women that we're talking about. Um, these are young women and likely uh, women with children, young children. Um, which kind of plays into the sustainable development goal aspect that uh, was mentioned previously, and I'll touch on a little bit further. But we also see that um, these widows, uh, also 50% of them don't have any source of income. 70% live on that live under that extreme poverty qualification of less than two dollars a day. Um, and tragically, most widows experience some form of family or cultural or legal bar barrier to their inheritance. Uh, next slide. Um, to continue on with that inheritance issue, that's just one of the main rights violations that we see occurring to widows globally. Um, we kind of classify these violations into three buckets. Uh, that first bucket is disinheritance. Um, it often means that, you know, in the case of a customary law or a customary marriage, uh, there are no papers to prove her right to inheritance. So the husband's family keeps the assets. Um, he keeps the, they keep the family home. Um, it also prevents women from accessing income if they were part of a joint estate that was supporting their livelihoods. Um, and so it really affects her ability and therefore her children's ability to make their basic, meet their basic needs. That second bucket is discrimination. Um, we're talking institutional discrimination. Uh, this could be anything from uh, church, leaders or uh, other religious leaders like the local imam to local community chiefs um, and tribal leaders. It can mean government officials at the local level. Uh, there's some sort of barrier for them uh, in accessing um, land restitution, other additional justice in a land grab. Um, and in conflict situations, we sometimes see uh, statelessness as being an issue in terms of a woman and her children being able to access social services in post-conflict. Uh, and then finally, the third bucket is harmful traditional practices. This can range from anything to shaving to cutting um, to sexual cleansing rights, uh, which sometimes uh, the woman must have pay to have the privilege of experiencing uh, sexual violence to cleanse her of the sin of her husband's death. Um, but then under all of this, there is also a high level of stigmatization and discrimination that occurs within the community. Uh, we really do see a lot of our widows sort of at the margins of public life. Next slide, please. And then to again, to get back to that point on the SDGs, uh, the issue of widowhood, um, and as you can see at the center of our wheel there, 
uh, we have those three main buckets of uh, human rights violations. Um, but those are all sort of tragically linked to the same sustainable development goals. Without an income, a woman has to take her children out of school because she can't pay school fees. Well, then one of the first things that we see our widows doing is looking to marry off her daughters if they are of marrying age, uh, because it provides them the social protection um, that she's not able to give them. Um, so we see, you know, that link to child marriage. We see it linked also to um, nutrition and health access, because without an income, how can you really afford um, to, to, you know, support your family in that way? Um, and I know it's difficult to see, but it really, um, it really is tragically and inextricably intertwined. And at Global Fund for Widows, we do believe that to, to fulfill these SDGs, we have to be paying more attention to widows and the unique situations uh, that they experience uh, as a result of being a member of that group. Next slide, please. That is all, you know, a lot to take in. Um, so, but I also know that I'm here to speak about resilience and that's what Global Fund for Widows really, um, really does in its programmatic work. Uh, we are an economic empowerment and inclusion um, organization. We've been working uh, with partners across the globe for about a dozen years now um, on our microfinance initiative. Uh, we call it a WASALA, it's a Widows Savings and Loan Association, and I'll just touch briefly on how the WASALA works, but how we also um, see it bringing about meaningful change uh, for these women. So as I mentioned, our widow is typically disinherited or discriminated against, um, a victim of harmful traditional practices. Um, really doesn't have any sort of like meaningful pathway forward within her current context. So what Global Fund for Widows does is we establish these, um, these groups of widows in a wasala. Um, the widow provides uh, some buy-in to this initiative and um, the other portion of the buy-in comes from Global Fund for Widows. So it's like a traditional savings and loan association, but we give it a little extra oomph to accelerate the impact of uh, that capital. So instead of each member taking a, a turn once a week on who gets the money, um, every widow in our Wasala is able to access immediately the funds that she needs to begin her own enterprise. Um, so we see them being able to begin their own businesses and start developing a sustainable income almost immediately because they're so familiar with the context that they're working within, the needs of their community, that they can be quite successful in these endeavors right away. Um, we also know that once these women are establishing um, and sort of solidifying their, their financial status, uh, not only is their household income increasing, but the kids are back in school, there's better health and nutrition opportunities. Um, but we also see these women taking on a much more sort of public role uh, within their community, becoming leaders in their community. Um, but also developing really strong uh, connections to the other widows in their wasala. So it's not only a form of economic empowerment, um, but it is a, a place for social resiliency as well. Next slide, please. And just to sort of quantify a little bit of our impact to date, we have um, worked with oh, almost 20,000 widows um, as members of our WASALA. Um, and we now have a, almost 80 of those banks established um, in Egypt alone, or is it, I, actually, sorry, it's in Kenya alone. We have 15,000 widows on a waiting list to have the opportunity to participate in a WASALA. Uh, so there is still a lot of 
um, need, but also a lot of opportunity for us to really serve uh, more of these widows and more of their, these families. Um, as you can also see, uh, almost 52,000 children have also been positively impacted by the uh, livelihoods opportunities and changes that the women have been able to make. And then uh, during COVID, um, we've had to do a little bit of a pivot in terms of focusing on emergency food support. And we have to date offered um, almost 6 million meals to these families. Um, but then just to sort of end on that happy note, again, of resiliency and how this economic inclusion initiative uh, really provides and paves the path to a return to public life. Uh, we've had three of our widows uh, actually run for public office in their communities. One of them has been elected. And that was within uh, about a year and a half of them uh, joining the Wasala and starting their participation in the Wasala program. So they essentially went from the fringes of their community to community leaders um, through their you know, entrepreneurial skills, as well as their leadership um, within the community, which is always incredible to see. Um, I am happy to, to field questions from everyone uh, after the rest of my colleagues have presented today on the issue. And I, again, really appreciate your audience. And I really look forward to advancing this issue within the gender equality community um, and within the human rights and international space. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marike. Um, it, you should take a look at the chat to see all of the um, uh, questions. I definitely, I definitely will. I was trying to- uh, The uh, praise too, like um, the information that they didn't know. So thank you so yes, much. Yes, it definitely flies under the radar, but thank you for flagging that for me, Susan. Yes, and I'm glad we started with you. Now we have three more speakers. Um, our next speaker is Lily Thapa. She's the founding um, president. Who is this on the screen? My goodness, who knows? Anyway, Lily is the founding president of Women for Human Rights. And this organization has been working for the social, political, economic, economic and legal rights for widows in Nepal and South Asia for the past 25 years. We're so honored to have her. She's a lecturer at the University of Nepal and is an honorary member of National Human Rights Commission. The floor is yours, whatever that means, Lily. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Suzanne. And good evening from Nepal and namaste to everyone. So glad to hear the previous speakers about the, you know, the widow's status here. I'm going to uh, share you about the status of the widows here in Nepal and how the, my organization has been working for the rights of the women, uh, widows from last 25 years. Actually, you know, in Nepal, uh, we have 52% uh, women in general, and among the 52%, 6% uh, are the widows. That means 1 million. And among that 6%, 67% are in between 20 to 35 years of age. But this is the data of 10 years back, census data. Maybe they are a little uh, grown up, but uh, majority of the widows uh, are uh, young here. Uh, having three to four children in an average. And among these uh, 6% widows, 86% are illiterate, totally illiterate as per the census data. Only 2% have a higher degree here. You can imagine how these illiterate women, the widows without male support can survive in the country like ours. And we all know that Nepali, you know, in Nepal, widows are poorly treated minorities in our society. And we have a lot of a lot of a code of conduct, a lot of a discriminatory ill cultural practices that I'm not going to share here because it takes a lot of time. And most of the young widows are often held responsible for their husband's death. And there's a very common word used is a husband eater in Nepali. And so it's very common in our village. 
and most of the widows become more vulnerable to physical, sexual, and psychological abuse after their husband's death. Because in Nepal, actually, uh, the widow's position is derived uh, uh, only from the relationship with her husband, under whose legal protection she is. That is why, you know, after the death of the husband, these widows seek and engage in the informal sectors where she get a lot of, lot of a ha harassment, violence. And because we used to get a lot of a cases of uh, not only physical violence, but we have many, many sexual violence among the young widows. I just wanted to brief a little bit about the property rights, as you mentioned, as you asked me to brief. And you know, in Nepal, actually, in general, um, women, only 20% women have a land in their name. And only 12% of women in Nepal have a house in their name. So you can understand how women without husband have uh, access to the property rights. It's very rare. It's very difficult because we still have a joint family system because majority of the women uh, in, in Nepali family are the joint family system where most of the property is in the control of the male family members. And you know that male is entitled to the property and women, especially the widows are seen just as a household worker, like a domestic worker, free domestic workers. And a few years back, uh, there was a policy actually where widows have to take a permission. Um, uh, widows have to take a permission of their uh, son and unmarried daughter to use her own share of property. And I'm very pleased to share you that I personally filed that cases. Being a mother of three sons, I filed that cases to the Supreme Court, and we won that cases. Now that policy is already been over. We don't need to. Uh, get the permission of our son and uh, unmarried daughter. But still, there's a lot of uh, cases of property grabbing. You know, we have a huge number for the uh, widows coming to our uh, groups asking for the help of the property rights. And you know that WHR, my organization have played a vital role on changing a lot of a lot of a discriminatory legal policies from our country code from last 10, 12 years. But despite of many, many legal uh, provisions, implementation continues to be very problematic. You know, it, it's very challenging. And I feel that this is a challenge because progressive laws go uh, against established, uh, you know, the customs and the practices. And you know that in many cases, uh, widows are deprived of their inheritance right because they, they are uh, in-laws, basically in-laws, prevent them from accessing their husband's documents, especially you know, the vital registration documents such as a marriage certificate, citizenship, uh, relationship certificates. And uh, so it's very difficult for them to have access to that document. So without that documents, they couldn't inherit any of the property of their husbands. And also, you know, like I mentioned, the majority of them are illiterate. So being an illiterate, most of the widows, you know, lack knowledge on the importance of the um, vital documents. And we have many cases where widows, uh, you know, have to lose their property and assets and they are isolated and ostracized from the communities. And we can, I, I don't want to share more about that. And we know that loss of financial insecurity can have far reaching uh, implications and often face physical and sexual violence. And uh, you know that I just wanted to mention you that uh, we had a conflict in the past for 12 years, you know, which transformed almost, uh, 10,000 women has been transformed as a widows. And they all were young with small dependents. And you know that after a few years, we had a big earthquake, which has snatched their houses. But now with the COVID, you can see the COVID, you know, COVID, most of the majority of the widows who were in the informal sector, they have lost their job. So you can imagine, you know, it's so difficult for us to, you know, it's a really, really tough and challenging uh, for every one of us uh, to overcome from all these challenges one after another, you know, it's so difficult. And every incidence in our country has been, you know, increasing many, 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 many young widows and dependents. And, uh, you know, like uh, in COVID actually, uh, during this uh, one, nine months, uh, 8,000 people have been died here. 
And what we came to know that 70% were men. So we are assuming we don't have actual data statistics, but we are trying to gather the data from our group because we have a group all over in our country. But till now from the government data, what we have found are around 3000 to 4000 women has been you know, turned into widows. Now, just because of the COVID within a year of time. So, uh, you know, we can imagine how these widows will be survived without their male partners, you know. So we have a one after another conflict, then earthquake, then COVID. So it's, I cannot describe much more about that. And we are getting several, several calls from the widows from our groups across the country because of all these pressures, uh, the, all the, you know, the widows, they are going through the mental trauma. So we even I, I can, uh, you know, uh, may, we haven't have a uh, think about how these uh, widows go through the mental trauma. We haven't worked so much about the mental health of the widows, but because of the COVID, we really have to think about that. And we from our organization, we are trying our level best, you know, as you know, that we've been doing a lot of our support morally, financially, mentally. And we, beside that, because of the COVID, because of the pandemic, we've been continuously monitoring through our group at, to the local governments to ensure that the relief and the recovery and the responses uh, reaching to our widows group properly. That is what we've been continuously monitoring. And as I just wanted to mention you that because WHR, Women for Human Rights, have a large membership-based organizations around the country. We have organized more than 200,000 widows all over the country. Uh, so it's a big, large group. So we, what we have been trying, we've been organizing and we've been mobilizing them in the community to bring the changes, to, to fight for all these injustices, to fight for all these ill cultural practices. But it's really, really tough because it's this kind of a cultural practices has been rooted, deep rooted in our culture and in our religion. And you know that is so difficult for us to revolt against the religion and the culture thing. It's really, really difficult. But although we are trying our level best to support our groups, and uh, and and one thing that what we have been looking forward to have more widows at the policy level so that they can themselves, you know. Uh, the carve their, uh, you know, uh, their policy, their for, for the rights for the widows at, at all level. And lastly, what I wanted to mention, you know, because when we had a lockdown and many widows had lost their job because they were all in the informal sector on small shops, restaurants and tailoring, beauty parlor or whatever on a small way, but they all lost the job and they were uh, kind of a homeless because majority of the widows don't have a home. They are on the rental and they're not been able to pay the rental. And then when I contacted some of the international organizations here, uh, like DFID, because I got a very clear answer from the DFID. Like when I asked them, why not you, because DFID has been working a lot on the relief and the recovery. When I asked the DFID people to support the widows group for the relief and the recovery thing, and what they respond me, you know, like they said that we, the widows are not the target group of DFID right now. Next time we'll definitely bring the widows in our plan and policy. That is the response I got from the uh, DFID people. Uh, so that I, I'm really wondered, you know, uh, the widows are not excluded from the from their home, from their community. They are even excluded from the international community as well. So this is the one point I really wanted to highlight in this forum. How can widows be mainstream at all level? So uh, we, we don't have to only focus on the home, their house, but we really have to think and change the mindset of the people who are at the UN and at the international level as well. And thank you so much for giving me this platform and I'll be happy to respond many questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Lily. Um, and thank you for bringing in the, um, all of the changes due to COVID, the losing of the job, the, the home, um, the increase of widows. Um, I know Bandana has been sending me um, reports of what is going on and it is so, so painful um, what is going on in Nepal. Um, please, um, oh, and thank you for touching on inheritance and land rights, which is so important. Now people are starting to put um, questions in the chat. Um, so continue to do um, doing that if, if you could. I just have 
you know, I had this vision. If all of the widows in the world got together and was a political force, wouldn't it be amazing? There would be so many of us and some of us could make a lot of noise and encourage the others to do so. And thank you for your work of 25 years working with the widows. You are, um, you are incredible, a wise woman, yes. All right, our next speaker is, um, is um, ja uh, Yasmin um, Yusu Sharif. Is she here? She is, isn't she? Yes, Yasmin, are you here? Um, we, Susan, we, I don't think that she's here yet. Oh, okay. All right, then we'll move on um, to, and then if she gets in, um, uh, uh, could you contact her, Pam? And maybe email her? I've done that. Oh, you've done that. Okay. Yes. Well, we hope she joins us. Well, um, Margaret Owen is our next speaker. And um, she is a human rights lawyer who has been lobbying the UN system and governments to eliminate discrimination. Um, let's see. All right. To eliminate dis discrimination. Um, and abuse suffered by widows of all ages. And she has been working on this since she hosted the very first international workshop on widows at the Beijing conference in 1995. She is the founder and president of Widows for Peace Through Democracy, the umbrella organization for many emerging widows associations in the developing world. Um, what can I say? I'm a great admirer of um, Margaret Owen. Take it away, Margaret. She's a great speaker. Hello, everyone. Now, well, it's just been extraordinary to see you all here. And thank you so much, NGO CSW New York, for putting on a special panel on widowhood. Because it is an absolute scandal that after 25 years, and it's 25 years ago, or I think 24 years ago, that I first met the wonderful Lily Thupper. And I must say that Women for Human Rights Single Women's Group in Nepal is my very favorite widows organization because it's really an organization from the grassroots. And all the times I've been in Nepal, I've seen how Lily gives these women the confidence to speak. But what I really want to talk about today in my 10 minutes is that the scandal of the blanket of invisibility that is put on this most neglected of all gender and human rights issues. It's extraordinary how we lobbied and lobbied in every single commission at the status of women since the Beijing platform, and very rarely have we ever had a mention. But last March, I mean this March, at the CSW virtual, the priority theme was women in decision-making and eliminating violence against women. And yet widows' voices have been silenced Hardly any government even knows how many widows they've got. You talk about, oh, in 2015, maybe 245 million widows. That the numbers are far higher. And every moment as I speak now, new widows are being created, not just by conflict, but as you've heard from Lily and from Global Fund for Widows, that COVID is not only an extra great widow maker, but the lockdowns that have come from the COVID have even further exacerbated the poverty of these widows when their remittances dried up and they can't even access any form of labor that might have given them income. And so it's a key driver, widowhood, of taking girls out of school who themselves go into child marriage and child widowhood. And I hope you've all read the wonderful work by Dr. Mahinda Watson 
on child marriage and child widowhood. <laughs> but what I really want to say at this meeting is that this is not a fringe women's issue. It's the impact of the neglect of widowhood on the whole of society and its future. It's about all the children who are impacted because they are mothers of widows who are taken out of education. The girls, yes, into trafficking, early marriage, prostitution, child widowhood, and then they also, their children also, it's the same thing. But now we haven't just got widows of all ages and many, many child widows. We've also, because of conflicts, we've got many, many what we called half widows. These are the wives of the forcibly disappeared or the missing. And in so many countries where rape also is a weapon of war, and what do you do in conflict? You divide the men and boys from the women and girls, you kill the men and boys, and you rape and put into sexual slavery the women and girls. But lots and lots of in conflicts, abduction is also a weapon. And we have many, for example, in Sri Lanka, we have over 30, 40,000 Tamil half widows who never know what happened to their husbands. The refugee and ID key pants now are full of widows who've been displaced by the conflicts that are made by men. I'm thinking of the Rohingya widows camp in Bangladesh at Cox's Bazaar, the widows camp in Idlib in Syria. And then, then we are widows for peace through democracy are for all widows, whatever their ethnicity, their religion, the political faction of their husbands or their own. Don't let's forget those misguided girls who became the widows of the ISIS fighters, the brides of the jihadists. They're also in Al Hol camp and they also, we have to look after them because they have a right as a human being to justice and be brought back to the countries that they came from. I think that it was important to understand that if we neglect the widowhood issues, we will never achieve the social development goals, nor the agenda 2030, nor will we ever eliminate violence against women. And the CEDAW, which is now 42 years old, is really hardly fit for the purpose to deal with the terrible violence that widows of all ages and the half widows and the widows in the refugee camps suffer because of unbelievable patriarchal misogynist interpretations of religion and custom. I think that it's a great distress to me. I'm now 89 years old and I've been working on this since I was widowed when I was 58, that we still don't have a general recommendation from the CEDAW and that we were completely omitted from the agreed conclusions of the Commission on the Status of Women. And so we have to look at all other sorts of available means. We know that widowhood is a root cause of expanding and extending pov intergenerational poverty that affects the whole of the country. And that if you don't have widows who are the survivors of genocides, the survivors of revolutions and conflict and terrorism and natural disasters, if you don't have them in decision making, if you don't have them at peace tables, you will never get truth and justice and reconciliation. So we have to say, so what I'm really talking to you here, all of you today, look at the WPD, Widows Peace for Democracy website, and you will find our dossier, which is the actual evidence that CEDAW asked for, which actually, and it's an open dossier, so you can go on contribute to it. It's the evidence that we hope will persuade the committee at the CEDAW to actually develop a general recommendation on widows. But we also think that we need to ask the Security Council and I'm there every month talking each month to the president of the Security Council 
that on their widow's peace and security agenda, they have to have widows. And I was talking this last month, listening to the president this month of his, from Estonia, who says that the Security Council is now commissioning a second report on children in armed conflict. But if they don't look at the mothers of the children in armed conflict, so many of them are widows. So it makes sense that we actually implore the Security Council to commission a special report on widowhood in armed conflict or widowhood, and that they appoint now a special UN rapporteur on widowhood or on widowhood in armed conflict. And that we also ask the Security Council to require member states in, to do in their next national action plan to implement 1325, that they must put in their targets and indicators what they are doing about widows. Because ultimately it's governments, governments that have to count their widows, hear their widows. And I commend Kenya and Ghana and Tanzania and Malawi, who have actually in their criminal penal codes, criminalized anybody who coerces a widow into appalling mourning and burial rights, which really should be taken up by the treaty committee on the UN Convention Against Torture, because a lot of the mourning and burial rights that widows suffer in Africa and parts of South Asia are actually torture. And it's also a scandal to me that the UNFPA, which continually talks about harmful, uh, addressing harmful traditional practices, only talks about child marriage, FGM, and son preference. But why don't they ever talk about widowhood? And because, as Lily has said, and our great friend Eleanor Nwadinobi in Africa has pointed out, with COVID now, there is an increase of widows giving away their children into child marriage. And that is also increasing the unbelievably dangerous, life-threatening cutting FGM. So I am also asking that the security, that we also have to ask the Human Rights Council to have a special resolution on, on, on widows. And then I've got another idea. All the time, we've got to look at all other mechanisms. Maybe forget the CSW. Maybe the working method is completely wrong. But you know, and many of you will have seen, last, week, last weekend, we had a meeting of G7 in Cornwall. And there was a photograph. And only one woman leader about to retire Angela Merkel, and then our splendid Queen and Ursula von Leyen from the EU. And the next day, it was a meeting of NATO in Brussels. Again, only one woman, about Angela Merkel. And then we have yesterday, Putin and Biden meeting, and we did actually send a letter to them, which they've probably never seen from the women of the world. Let us get more women into decision-making. If only women were running with men the world, if only we adopted the Kurdish method of co-chairs in every single really supper. At the end of that win into parliament, 11 of those 41 women were widows. And we do want widows at every level of decision making, at, at, from the top and down to the grassroots and to the villages. And we also have to have women with, as widows at the peace tables, remembering that it's the widows who are the witnesses when we ever, if we ever finally are able to prosecute those who perpetrate crimes against humanity. It will be the widows whose testimonies are needed, just like they were for the terrible 
terrible genocide of Srebrenica. And then what happened in Rwanda? When do we ever learn? Um, so I hope then that um, you will, all of you think that next month there is a big summit on education, which is being hosted by Boris Johnson because he's uh, hosting the G7 with President Uhuru Kenyatta from Kenya, chaired by the former Prime Minister Julia Gallard um, of um, Australia. And they are going to talk about keeping children in school. Well, they won't keep any children, all these children in school, if they don't look at one of the key drivers of taking boys and girls out of school is the poverty and discrimination and stigma and marginalization and displacement and homelessness and hunger that widows have to suffer. But always in all the work that WP does for widows, we never want the world or governments to see them exclusively as poor, vulnerable and needy. No, we want them to recognize their crucial social and economic roles that they have in society as sole parents, as children, as farmers, as market women, as workers. And so it's absolutely essential that we hear their voices. And you know, when Susan O'Malley, who I love dearly and has always been such a support to me, she said, if widows around the world, could come together, but we're saying if women around the world, and our letter to Biden and Putin was that we women are 75% of the population of, 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 of women, and of that 75%, many, many are widows because they are of all ages, from a three-year-old child to a 90-year-old grandmother to young mothers, they are so many of us. And, it's un and if you look at the countries which do have real gender equality central and women leaders or co-women leaders, you'll see that they were able much more successfully to tackle not only the pandemic, COVID-19, but also to reduce violence against women and also to do much more to save our planet. Um, so please go into our website, look at our dossier, try and get your governments to involve themselves in the education summit that is happening next week, and look at all the other treaties of UN treaties on homelessness, on poverty. Don't just depend upon the CSW. And also look at our Every Woman Treaty. We've got a new treaty now to combat violence against women because the CEDAW is no longer fit for purpose with all the new systematic widespread violence to, wi to widows that they suffer. And we've got several articles in that draft treaty. So I hope that you will be in touch with the Every Woman Treaty and look at those articles about widowhood in that. I'm going to stop now. I'm very old and I often talk too much and too long. But thank you, all of you, for what you said. And let's all come together, work together to get widowhood on the international agenda because it's a scandal. They said, let no one be left behind. Whatever they said, widows have been left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for your eloquence. Also, thank you for all of the different ideas that you suggested because we're going to move into question and answers and also a call for action, ideas of things we need to do. I, I want to report that it looks like there's a problem with the internet and getting connected with Sierra Leone. We've tried and tried and, and, and it's not, not working. Um, but so let's move and uh, Pamela's going to move, um, uh, conduct the Q&A. Um, and I must say, everyone look in the chat. There's a lot of exciting things happening in the chat. Pamela. Thank you, Susan.
And thank you to the wonderful, inspiring, informational presenters. Thank you all. I'd like to start with Sylvia Beale's question, and it's directed to Lily. Could you comment on the importance or challenge of having the status of widow? How might that affect access to entitlements? Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. This, no, Sylvia, this question is for Lily. We're asking Lily to respond. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, actually, I didn't get the questions. Can you please repeat it? Also? Yes. Could you comment on the importance or challenge of having the status of widow and how that might affect access to entitlements? To entitlements? Uh, okay, but uh, basically, if you just talk about the, the widows in Nepal, uh, because uh, being a well, majority of the widows being an illiterate, uh, they, are, they are having a lot of uh, challenges on inheritance rights. And we have a lot of uh, property grabbing cases over here. And basically, you know, widows are being a very uh, big human resources of our country. Because I'm just giving you some examples right now, because not only in the COVID, but at the time of the conflict as well, the widows group have played a role of the peacemakers in the community as well. You know, because uh, we are the one who, uh, you know, the groups uh, welcome the widows from all the, both the conflicting parties at that time. And we've got a huge, a big peace award at that time as well, because bringing all the widows from the conflicting party and bring them together in a group was a really a challenging step for us at that time. So widows uh, played a lot of a role in the peace building as well. And at the time of the earthquake, we've been engaged on a lot of humanitarian work. And now in the COVID also, because as I uh, maybe you may be aware of some of the, uh, you know, the informations that has been published in UK, uh, uh, some paper as well, uh, because we've been uh, right now engaged on uh, doing a lot of humanitarian work through our groups, because we have a groups all over in our country. So the groups are mobilizing for the humanitarian work as well. So maybe I'm not clear on the questions what you have asked, but what I wanted to emphasize that widows uh, are major, uh, you know, creator and major peace builders of our community of our country. So widows have to be acknowledged and their contribution have to be acknowledged by all levels, at all levels. That is what, I'm, I'm not sure what questions was of me. Lily, I think that you did a fine job of responding. Thank you. Uh, the Pamela. next question is from Linda McDonald. And the question is, what are the unique issues of girl child widows after enduring forced marriage, then widowed? And that question is for any of the panelists and it's from Linda McDonald. I'll repeat, what are the unique issues of girl child widows after enduring forced marriage then widowed. So would any of the three like to address that? Yeah, I just wanted to share our example here of the child widow because we in Nepal, in some of our rural part, uh, we still have a, um, you know, kind of a practice of uh, uh, girls getting married before first menstruation. You know, and after the first menstruation, then in a particular date when the priest says, and then she, uh, she goes to the husband's house. But we have uh, many cases that the husband, who also has a very child age, he if he didn't take, uh, come to take the, her bride, then uh, she's considered uh, more worse than widows. You know, and she, uh, she's, she has to go through a lot of uh, uh, cultural uh, implications worse than widows. And we have a number of the young, uh, you know, the child widows in our country. And uh, we are from our, our WHR actually filed the cases to the Supreme Court against the government to stop that child marriage, that practices. But you know that that practice is related to the cultural of some particular caste here. So it's really difficult to change the mindset. So still that practice is going on, though it's, it's been considered as a crime in our, in our laws, but it's still, you know, it's been going on. 
so the girls uh, you know even the very young they even don't know if they are getting married or they have to go to uh, their husbands out they totally unaware of that so it's a forced marriage is still going on if you just look at channel 4 youtube there's a uh, real story of child widows of nepal it's on channel 4 of uk you can see that child marriage uh, uh, documentary as well thank you so much for that comprehensive uh a response lily would either of the other two panelists want to respond to that question regarding child yes I, i think like margaret to... is keen <laughs> margaret can i speak yeah, margaret oh, yes thank you child widows what is extraordinary to me is that unicef and unfpa for a long time have been talking about child marriage but they never got on to child widowhood I'm glad that somebody uh, nearly just mentioned that great um a uh, program that was done about child widows in Nepal but because there are child widows everywhere and last week I saw the most amazing on um, channel 4 or BBC or channel 4 news about the widows camp in Idlib in Syria where again the widows were crying because there was nothing they could do but give their children away in child to a, to to some old man to marry them this is also happening in the mahmud camp in the camps in dohuk everywhere where there are refugee camps where there are widows there's a huge increase now in the trafficking of these girls even child widows child i mean children taken in what is called temporary marriages by people who come up from the gulf it's an absolute scandal and as for child widows so you could be married there were these girls that we were talking to and listening to them talking in this camp in idlib in syria and they'd been married when they were 12 they were having babies before their bodies were ready for babies they barely started their menstruation before they were pregnant and many of them had very underweight babies or their babies died or their their, their babies were ill also when these children are married often in polygamous marriages and then the husband dies a lot of them and i remember elena telling us about what was happening in africa in many countries the children were all often married to men whose wives had died of aids but they didn't know that they husbands were carrying aids and the husband dies and then the stepchildren either rape the widow or kick her out so it's and then that widow is a child carries all the stigma that we have talked about in all these programs so if we don't address the poverty of widows and if we don't help to keep widows in decision making with pensions with social security with protection from violence if we don't use governments to use their criminal law to criminalize people or non-state actors or state actors who deprive widows of their rights to inheritance to land to food security then we will go on seeing this phenomenon increasing and it is increasing and child marriage and ftm is increasing because so many more widows are being created by covid so you know all of you i mean i'm what am i i'm a so called human rights lawyer but i don't see anyone respecting the human rights of widows like it has to be so let's all come together looking at all available institutional mechanisms there are and i think we really do need this new every woman treaty to really ensure that when we talk about violence against women and girls the terrible violence that widows suffer which includes the violence to children it's their widowhood that causes these children to become the child widows so you know all Let's go on. We won't give up. We fight stronger than ever. Thank you. Thank you so much for that inspirational uh response Margaret. Thank you so much. I'm I'm fired up. 
Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Alice Fuchs. And I think this is directed to Hootie and the executive committee. Can I call on CSW to adopt widows as a priority theme as a matter of urgency? So I think that that would be a question that Hootie, would you want to respond? Sure. I, I mean, I am definitely fired up too with all this information and knowledge, and I am completely on board with shaking up CSW working methodology. As you know, Pam, we've been talking about it within our executive committee. Just because we're NGO Committee on Status of Women and our mandate is CSW doesn't mean we have to agree with everything that comes out of there. We are frustrated. We are really upset that all of these inf important information and topics that we introduce to member states and then they are just dismissed or not included in the outcome document is unacceptable. So as a civil society, and I think um, Susan mentioned something about how if all widows gathered, like what would their voices together mean diplomatically, right? Like uh, how, could, how could you all shake up the world? Um, in your in your own collective power and as far as widow as a specific topic i'm not that i'm not going to say it's impossible i think we have to make sure that it is across the board any topic we talk about for example next year is climate change right climate justice um you can see how important widows are in the climate justice um argument if it's I, I mean, I can give you so many examples, but I really do want to reassure everyone that as far as I'm concerned, and I was going to say this in my closing remarks, but I'll just say it now since you gave me the mic, there, we can't dismiss any of these topics. Like, I really want to address everybody who feels left behind, including widows. We can't say one is better. We can't rank them. Widow's rights is not better than a uh, child marriage, let's say, or is not more important than marginalized societies like, like LGBTQI and trans community. Every single human being who feels like their, their rights is not being served, we have to fight for that. And we have to include it in all of these conversations. And I do understand the argument about really singling out specific communities that are not being um, recognized in in certain documents and, and agreements. That's important as well, but we as NGO CSW have to represent a collective global human rights for all. Thank you. Thank you, Hootie. Uh, the next question is from Elizabeth, and I think this is directed to Margaret. Please, where and when exactly? is the education summit taking place? How do we get invited and I'll add, and how do we gain access if we can't get invitations? Margaret. Oh, I'm so glad that you, you picked up on that. Well, go into your Google and you'll Google um, uh, GPE, global um, um, something education, and you'll find it, GPE. And then you'll see that it's being chaired by Julia Gillard, who was former Prime Minister of Australia. So she is the chair. And we will, I've got some of my board on this thing. I think, I think Sylvia's here and Alice is here and Alice Fuchs is here. And we will send you the letter that we are trying to get out to President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta to Boris Johnson and to Julian uh, and to Julia Gillard, because we're saying they're not going to get anywhere unless they look at widowhood. And can we please be there and speak to them? So I think if you write into us, WPD, write into me or to George uh, um, uh, Gelba, our chair, and we will then give you our letter. And then you go and you work with all your governments to be sure that that global summit for education, you support us that we all want to be sure that actually widowhood, because it's not going to go anywhere unless they address widowhood. But at the same reason, 
when I talked about earlier on about the Security Council commissioning a special second report on children and armed conflict. Remember 20 years ago, it was Grassa Marcel who did the first report on children and armed conflict, but they didn't look at widows. And I think that we need to work with organizations like War Child because everybody is talking about the children, but it's the children who are the children of widows. So widowhood isn't just that it's in pushing child marriage, it's also putting boys out of school who become at risk of child soldiery. They're in the madrasas maybe, they're out of work, and they're also widowhood is a key driver of unaccompanied migrant children. We've got hundreds of children arriving Dover in the England now, and I want to get in my car, except my children made me get rid of my car and drive down to Dover and fill it with unaccompanied minors and hide them in the attic in my London house. But there's so many of these young people who are coming, mainly boys, because their fathers have been killed. And they're here to try and get jobs and send money back to support their widowed mothers and their sisters. So that's what it is. You asked me the question about the education summit, but let me just say, that's just one thing we picked up on. But you know, when the UNFPA did that report on harmful traditional practices and never mentioned widows, we've got to be vigilant. We've got to look wherever we can for, for entry points where we can make our voices heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as an aside, Devin put in the chat that the uh, young leader winner from Sierra Leone was also unable to uh, access the uh, today's session. So it's very likely that the technical issue in Sierra Leone is very serious. Okay, we're going to move on to Sylvia Beale's question. And I think that she's trying to clarify. What I meant was does the recognized label of widow mean it is easier to access entitlements in Nepal or the opposite? important if we, I think should be, are advocating for marital status to be included in census, et cetera. And Lily, would you want to respond to that? Um, yes, actually, uh, uh, we, it took almost uh, three, four years to include uh, the, you know, the marital status into the census. And you know that Nepal is the second country after India having that uh, census uh, data on widowhood. So it was really difficult to, you know, put, but we, we did a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, consultation and process uh, together with the government uh, authorities uh, to keep that, uh, you know, the uh, widow's data into the census. And it's really tough because other countries, because we have a one network, Margaret was the creator of one of our South Asian network for the widow's empowerment and development. And we were uh, the secretary for last eight, nine years. And now uh, India have, uh, you know, taken the responsibility of the secretariat of that sandwich South Asian network. Because other countries, even Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, they tried a lot uh, to keep the, you know, the widow's data into their census, but it's not been happening so well. So it's really difficult because of the uh, resources that government had to spend to get the data of some particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing. So it's really difficult. But we did it for we did it uh, after having a uh, three four years of the. Uh, you know, uh, effort uh, to bring that data into the census. That is how, you know, uh, because I, what I uh, wanted to share here, uh, because if once you have a data, it's really uh, easy for us to do the advocacy at the policy level. That is why we've been able to change a lot of our uh, policy in, in regard to the widow's rights here in Nepal. Uh, because that census data was show, you know, strong tools for us to advocate at all at policy level. But um, uh, yeah, there's a the, uh, the point. Uh, there's a column on marital status, whether you, you are a widow or a divorcee or a, uh, or a wives of the missing husband. So the, we have a data of all these three categories of the single mm -hmm. women. That is why you know I, maybe I just want to mention about that. We change the word. 
uh, to a single woman uh, in, 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 in Nepali, you know, not in English because we use the word on the widows, but we have included the other single women who are divorcee and who are not married over 35 years and whose husband has been missing for, uh, from many years, uh, from last five years. Uh, so these categories of the widow women also been considered as a single woman in one category. And now government also trying uh, using the same kind of a terminology for the uh, widows, for the women who are divorcee, who are separated and whose husband has been missing. So. Thank you, Lily, for that response. I've put in the chat, sorry, links to two films that talk about women, what we see Deepa Achara, which is about a widow activist in Nepal, and The Witches of Gambaga, which is about the plight of women in Ghana. They are both compelling, they're free to access. So please click on the links in order to further increase your understanding of what happens to women in different parts of the world, women who are widowed. Also in the chat, we, you'll find lots of information about widowhood, about International Women's Day, about a report on widowhood and extremism, about the summit, the education summit. So please check the chat. We're going to ask everyone oh, to can please. I just, can I just say one thing? When I'm finished, okay? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We're going to ask everyone to please support the Every Woman Treaty, to commit to building awareness regarding the plight of women's, women, widows, in your community, as well as on a national and global UN level. Please reach out and help a widow in need if you possibly can. And I'm going to ask Susan if she has concluding remarks. I, what I wanna say first, we haven't said much about the International Widows Day, which is next week, um, UN Women is doing on, on the 23rd. Um, I don't know if we can post an invitation or uh, tell people how to get, um, if they want to um, participate or at least- The link is there. It. The, the link, link is, is there. in the chat. Oh, thank you, I missed it. Okay, I just wanna say, this has been a wonderful session. Um, that's all I have to say. I, I've learned so much, taken so many notes and been inspired. And there's so much work to be done. And thank you, Pamela. Thank you all. Mm. Hootie. Thank you, everyone. Thank, it's wonderful that we're all together on this and lovely to see some of you I know for a long time ago. Lily, my darling Lily, I knew you when you were first widowed with three tiny boys. Absolutely amazing what you've done and how you've given your Nepal widows a voice like that. And I just want to say International Widows Day is next week. I will be talking in the House of Lords with Cherie Blair and Lord Lumber, and I'm doing something I think for UN women, but I don't see that it's a day to celebrate. It's a day to be angry yep. that it, yep. we are still covered in the blanket of invisibility and we have lots to do so it's nothing to celebrate, but a lot more information. And we're all talking to each other much more than we had to get on a plane and get a hotel. We're now on Zoom. We're all together all over the world, whether we're in Colombia, Kashmir, Tamil, Syria, everywhere. The Yazidis in the Yazidi camp being bombed as I speak to you now. The widows of the Yazidis who have escaped from sexual slavery are now being bombed. So we've got so much information. We are all together. We've got power in our passion. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I want you to know that you are heard. You've always been heard and we will listen to you for as long as you have a voice and you're willing to share it with us. We are here to hear you. So thank you for your passion, for your un relentless work on this. I just want to acknowledge Christine Bakuti, you've had your hand up 
please write in the chat room your question and we will acknowledge you. I cannot open mics now. We need to move on to our official business. And Margaret, if you can lower your hand too, thank you so much for your contribution. And first of all, I do wanna thank Pam and Susan for this amazing program. For I, can, I know the hard work that goes behind this to bring these, these world-class speakers and to really educate us, you know, on, on a topic that, yeah, perhaps we have not heard too much about, but with, with ambitious advocates as all of you, more people are hearing it for sure. So um, I, I'm going to say thank you to all the speakers, to the organizers. This was amazing. And we really do need to move on to our business part of our meeting. And the first order is to invite Erica Higby, who is the chair of our election committee. As you all know, NGOCSW is a substantive, substantive committee of Congo and our elections are up and we've been announcing for a couple of months now, you know, Slate and anybody throwing in. So I just want to give the floor to Erica to officially let us know what's happening with our elections and then I can move on as hopefully the next chair <laughs> to tell you what's been going on with our business. Erica, the floor is, war is yours. Thank you, Uri. I appreciate that. Um, on behalf of the NGO CSW nominating committee, I would like to present the uncontested 2021 NGO CSW New York Executive Committee slate, who will now be elected by acclamation as allowed for in the bylaws, that's Article 10, Section 2. But for the record, please unmute yourselves now and say I for each of the new executive committee members <laughs> as I go through the list. So first is, give you a chance, just everyone go ahead and unmute. Oh, oh, uh -oh. First is Hori's wish come true. So Hori Gadalekian <laughs> um, as Yay. chair. Yay! Yay! Ay, 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 Congratulations, from Ivy, who's on maternity leave. She is so excited to be continuing. So she just messaged me. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Uh, Rosa Lazarde as treasurer. Yay! Hi, Yay. Rosa. Yay! Yay. Yay. Uh, Zika Leone as communications secretary. Safira Ramshfar as recording secretary. Yay, Yay. Yay Safira. Yes. Go, go. Yay. 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 Margarita Jones as the elected member at large. Yay. 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 Pamela Morgan as an elected member at large. Yay. Yay. And new to the executive commi committee, uh, Terry Ince as elected member at large. Yay. 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 Aye, aye. Thank you to the nominating committee and thank you all and congratulations to the new executive committee. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Erica. I guess that makes it official thank and we you. have 120 global witnesses. As, you, as some of you know, this usually happens at the church center second floor or the Salvation Army on Second Street, but this is the new world we live in. And in some ways, I'm so grateful because we have more support globally than just locally. So thank you all for being here, for witnessing that. And I do accept um, this, I guess, nominee. No, not nominee. Election. Yes, I am now officially the chair again for the next two years. Erica, thank you for your hard work. I know you have so much on your plate. So thanks for serving as a pleasure. Thanks. So here we are, 10 o'clock in the morning in New York City. And what can I say? I am inspired. I am moved. I don't want to talk too much. I do want to open the mic for a couple of people who do want to um, you know, talk. First of all, let me just ask anybody from the executive committee who wants to jump in and say something. I really want to give you all the floor too. Um, we have worked so hard behind the scenes, each one of you. Oh, before I forget, 
Is Yvonne here? Yes. Yvonne, can you unmute yourself, put yourself on camera? I wanna thank you so much. Yvonne has been an amazing member of the executive committee for at least four years. Um, and she is stepping down from the executive committee, but not stepping away, okay? Once an NGO CSW member or executive committee, you're always part of our family. Um, and I'm sure she will be involved in different um, parts of our organization and committees and all that. Um, so I wanna thank also Sun Yang Yoon, who most of you know, she was the chair eight, no, 10 years ago now. <laughs> and she also is an advisor and she's helped us through this transition and with the Generation Equality Forum, FW MAP, as you all know, Feminist Women's um, Movement Action Plan was a, a huge galvanizing force for us in the last two years in preparation for Generation Equality Forum. For those of you who are new and do not know, um, NGO CSW accepted the role of convener of Generation Equality Forum, which was a methodology created by UN Women and in, in invited France and Mexico to partner with them and co-organized co by civil society. So who knew that we were going to be in lockdown a couple of months after taking on that role and we kept adjusting and readjusting. So this is when I really like to thank executive committee again and our kick-ass office, Devin, and the interns that we've had in the last two years who've helped us put together and, and push this movement, both through NGO CSW and the official CSWs and the, of course, the huge virtual forum that we had this past year, and also Generation Equality Forum. As most of you know, the ending of this movement, as far as NGO CSW is concerned right now as convener, is at the end of the Paris Forum, which is July 2nd. So I need to be really clear on that. Our convening role, which was also um, handling civil society advisory group of 21 members, advocates, will close down. Of course, we'll send in our reports and you will all hear about all our achievements, but that, that chapter, that part of our work will end at the end of the Paris Forum. I will be representing NGO CSW in person, so I'm grateful for anyone who helped me get myself over there. I wasn't sure and I'm, I still have my doubts about traveling, but it seems to be okay. And I would not miss the opportunity to represent NGO CSW at an event like that. So I will be there. And of course I will report back to you all um, through emails because we do not meet again until September as this group, right? The NGO CSW larger global constituents does not meet until September. Um, I also wanna take this moment and the reason I'm mentioning all of this together is the connection between Generation Equality Forum and CSW. We have been thinking about and wondering if we can have a standalone meeting to show that even more clearly eventually you will see that. that. That is a very important part of our movement and our actions, right? So even though CSAG and the convening role ends on July 2nd, NGO CSW's involvement, support, and care for what happens with the action coalitions and GEF is a continuum, right? We'll do that as NGO CSW members, like any other organization, will want to keep an eye on and watch what they're, they're doing. We are not part of any specific action coalition, and this gives me the opportunity to keep repeating. NGO CSW is here to address and to show support human rights for all. That includes widows. That includes children, that includes LGBTQI, that includes trafficked women, that includes climate uh, justice. I, the, the list goes on and on and on. That, that inclu includes ra racism. I mean, even lists that have been, um, injustices that UN does not traditionally look into on a regular basis. As far, oh my God, Yvonne is here. 
Ivan, I see you. I'm going to interrupt myself and just please unmute yourself and give us a big shout out. I thank you so much for your everything that you've done as part of my executive committee in this last two years. The floor is yours. Yeah, um, good morning all, or good afternoon, good, good evening. Um, thank you, Huri. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to be on NGO CSW Executive uh, Committee, first with um, Susan O'Malley, who, who actually appointed me. And then two years ago, I was elected to the role as a member at large. It's been a great labor of love. And I will continue to work with NGO CSW. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, so I'm not going anywhere, I'm around. <laughs> So thank you all and congratulations to, to the new members of, of, of the committee and to those who have new positions, especially to um, Rosa as treasurer and, um, and to Marguerite and now as um, at large and, and welcome Terry to the team. <laughs> so it's, it's been great and thank you. And this has been a great um, program today. And of course, you know, wonderful to hear my great friend, Margaret Owen um, speak so passionately about widowhood. And just to say that next week, actually, um, I will be speaking about widow, widows uh, from a spiritual point of view on One Boat International Chaplaincy for COVID times where I speak on the fourth Wednesday of each month and it happens to be International Widows Day. So what else can I speak about except widows? Beginning from you know the, the, the scriptures, uh, there's, well, there's lots of scriptures in the Bible about widows. So I'll be talking about some of those and and some of the things that are happening currently with widowhood. So. That is amazing. Thank you, Yvonne. I'm so, so happy I saw you. And I'm sorry I interrupted my train of thoughts, but this is how we work, right? We, we make sure that it's inclusive. The minute I saw you, I'm like, of course, I'm going to give her a voice. Thank, well, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. That was fantastic. Oops, I'm sorry. I muted myself by accident. Sorry. <laughs> Here I am. So just to continue, and you can see how all of this is all connected with just the way Yvonne explained and described what it is that she's doing. Um, we cannot, yeah, it's all connected. So let me just move back to what I was saying about Generation Equality Forum and the connection to CSW. We as NGO CSW, of course, we, we did not um, engage in any specific action coalition because we don't engage with any just specific topic. We are human rights for all. So after the forums are over, we will be supporting UN Women and the Secretariat and whatever comes up with Generation Equality Forum and how it is connected back to the Commission on the Status of Women. Because the reason GEF was born be was because of our frustration of what was happening with CSW. So this will lead me into, as the new chair of I would re reelected chair of NGO CSW. What are some of our aspirations and hopes for next year? Of course, anything I say right now is just things that we've already kind of talked about in our executive committee, but nothing will be set in stone until we have our summer retreat. I am going to continue my passion to co-lead, to use my shared leadership collaborative and transparent leadership as much as possible with my new executive committee. So anything we say or decide will be shared with all of you. But the, the bottom line is that we are frustrated and not very happy with how CSW is operating. What happened last year with the amazing organization that we did as civil society, 27,000 people showed up on our virtual platform to speak, to share, to have their voices be heard. That should not be taken lightly. And believe me, member states are hearing it. People are talking about it. And perhaps it also is part of the reason why member state freak out and say, oops, you know, we have to be careful, can't give them too much space, can't give them too much air, civil society can disrupt, but we have to figure out a way how to make our voices be heard where we're not here to disrupt. We are here to collaborate, we are here to work with them to achieve the goals that we all need to have a better world. So we need to figure out, I always say, 
when you stand to point fingers, the first thing we, we need to do is really point towards us and say, what are our responsibilities? What are the commitments and the accountability mechanisms that we can provide as civil society so that member states can have respect and they can be including us and they can see that we are here to help them to achieve the goals. So, so part of that is also for us to figure out and meet and think how we are going to affect the next working methodologies of CSW. CSW 66 will have the working methods that will be addressed. So we're not gonna wait even until March or January. We are hitting the ground running to look at how can we influence um, to make the working methods more more susceptible to success, right? So, and inclusive of civil society. The fact that we can't be in negotiating rooms, the fact that even though we introduce language and we give them, um, we, we give them our draft outcome docu documents for them to use in their negotiations, and yet it is still removed. And yet we still see a country like Russia take over um, their speaking, you know, time and, and just talk for like half an hour or three hours. It's like a filibuster that we see in our own governments where they're not saying anything, they're just resisting change and outcomes. So we need to figure out how we can influence all of this in our own right. Um, so at 1012, I just wanted to say thank you again for the trust in us. And I want to really assure you that we as executive committee will do our best to come up with innovative, creative ways of bringing your voices to the United Nations making sure that no one is left behind truly, even though UN uses that language all the time. And I, I've been saying this a lot this year, but I will say it again. I think it's Fannie Lou Hamer who first said it, nobody is free until all of us is free. Nobody is really, I, I think we can't say that we achieved equality if not everybody achieves equality. Like there's no, left behind truly. So we'll see how we can move forward with this. I do want to open the floor to see if anybody has any comments, suggestions. And if I do give you the floor, please do not take more than 30 seconds to make it very brief so that I can hear from more voices. Um, and I'm sure I forgot an important something, but I can't think of it right now. And thank you, Margaret, for your support. I see you. Oh, yes, Beth, please. You have the floor and you can make your announcement about Working Group on Girls. Thank you, Hody, and congratulations. And thanks to Yvonne for your service in outgoing and welcome. And thanks to those of you on the executive committee uh, doing a couple of terms in a row, deeply appreciated by all of us. My name's Beth Lisman. I'm the UN rep for the US-based Loretto community, and we are proud members of the Working Group on Girls. And for those of you not familiar with us, we typically meet on the first Thursday of every month from 2 to 4 p.m. We might move that a bit later to catch more girls. Uh, and we work for uh, to support and encourage and involve girls' voices at the United Nations. And as we heard today with that wonderful, powerful program on widows, thank you, Pamela and Susan, for that. Um, many widows are girls, and many of those girls often get uh, caught up in, in forced labor, uh, including sexual labor. Um, but there's so much forced labor throughout the world with children, and so uh, one thing we're working with this year is the ILO uh, 8.7 Alliance, the International Labor Organization. We're trying to stem demand for clothing made with child labor kind of at the source. So many of the countries of the global north are the ones with the demand for those special brand name clothes that are made with child labor situations. And we need to educate. We need to educate uh, young folks in this country and other countries. And so if you would like to be involved with that, um, feel free to reach out to me. I put a little info into the chat. 
already. I'll do that again. I'll put my email. Please feel free to reach out if you have interest in joining us and getting involved. So thank you so much, Hoity. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you, Beth. And yes, please put that link again. Um, I just want to address Esther. You are absolutely right. I'm sorry I didn't even mention disabilities. And of course, my brain goes like, how many groups are out there who are, who are facing injustices and disabilities is certainly a large group that needs to be heard over and over again. We cannot. And thank you, Esther, for um, highlighting that. I also see this uh, nice comment from I think it's Crystal Allen. Um, let me just reiterate one important thing. Even though we have gone global, NGO CSW New York is a local committee. We are a substantive committee of Congo, but we are a New York-based committee. So our election, as we as you saw it, and as I said, usually happens in person, is a local election. We we unfortunately cannot include global activists in our executive committee. Not yet, we can change our bylaws and see how we evolve, but right now that's what we have. But we are very excited with the opportunity that this pandemic taught us that we can have hybrid models, right? So one of the obviously things that we have to think about with the new executive committee, what happens with CSW 66? We know this COVID might be better in the United States right now, which by the way, don't even get me started. You know, how are we privileged to have been vaccinated and not the rest of the world? We're not gonna get <laughs> political right now, but you can see this, this being, a perfect example of the inequalities, you know, um, obviously COVID did show us that. So um, we will consider the hybrid model, but at the end of the day, decisions are made locally at NGO CSW New York office at with NGO CSW executive committee who are based in New York or New York area, let's say, it doesn't have to be New York City. So, um, and if you do wanna get involved, I think the best way is to really see, first of all, attend our monthly meetings, connect with other people here. Um, there, are, there are other events that, especially if you're a young person, YLYP does amazing events. So please become a member or add your name to their ma ma uh, mailing list. Um, and I'm gonna give some numbers that I'm really proud of. I believe the YLYP list is up to 2000 right now. And I remember almost 10 years ago when we first started paying attention to youth members and started inviting youth. I think we started with maybe 25 people. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. So I'm very, very pleased to see that it's over 2000 YLYP members globally. Our mailing list has, uh, reached almost 45,000 um, and and that also is a huge number from maybe five to 10,000 that we had. And a lot of this is because of technology, right? So we have to acknowledge that we do have access to technology and that helps us gather more voices this way. So um, let me see if there's anybody else who wants to jump in. Otherwise, I can tell you to really enjoy your summer. And of course, I am going to make everybody unmute themselves, right? We know how we like to hear voices and send, send um, you know, love through the Wi-Fi's. Um, oh, Christine, you still, you didn't write anything. So go ahead. If you can take 30 seconds. I know you've been really dying to speak. <laughs> Okay, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to speak in English, in, in French, I'm unable to speak in English, but it's just only to greet you, say congratulations, and tell you that I'm working for the problem of widows in Cameroon, in Cameroon, yes, and I, I just waiting for the end of the COVID to come to meet physically go CSW and uh, let us join together to treat widow because I make a scientific scientific research on the prob on the, of the problem of widowhood, the stigmatization and traumatizing of widows. That is my um, so I am in New York. I'm 
I'm widow, me, I'm in widow, but I live in New York and I want to join the group because I have too much video. I work with Muslim, with you uh, and women Cameroon, but the country don't take care about that problem. I see they do something, but not too much. And that is why I want to share with you because I am newcomer, I don't know to speak English, and I'm, I'm going to English class. That's amazing. Congratulations. I, let, me just, let me just tell you, this is exactly a perfect example of Je what- parle français. Je parle. Okay, don't worry. I think you should put your information and connect with Susan and Margaret Owen. Those are the women that you want to be involved in. Susan, I hope you don't mind. And either... Je parle français, Christine. There you go. Yes, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you because I have association, a legalized association in Cameroon. But I have problem because I'm activist of women and they say I... Revolté in France, and I refuse to women to respect the custom. Yeah. That is why they, I run here, but I don't want to leave that fight. That fight, I want to continue to fight from here. And I, I know I cannot be strong alone. It's not possible. Christine, I hate to interrupt you, but thank you for your passion. Thank you for your work. And this is exactly why we like to use the chat. We have a hundred people right now on this and I wanna be um, careful on how we're using the time, everybody's time. So if you can put your information, your email, either directly to Susan, you know how to chat directly. I don't know, but I'm gonna learn. Okay, so look at, look at to your right on your screen. Either put the email in, in the chat. Do you see a chat? Okay. chat. All right. Wait. Here's here's a better so yes, I read something. Here's yes, a better I like to communicate with the person who speaks French, please. It will be easy to to me. I know. I, I am very cognitive of everybody's time here. So what I want to do is you send us your information at info at ngocsw.org. I N F O I N info at ngocsw.org. We okay. get email information. We will connect you with Susan and Margaret Owen. And I thank you so much for your patience with us. And okay. congratulations on the work you're doing in Cameroon. And by the way, I just saw another, I think Marieke, if you don't mind, I will connect you as well. Um, Olivia, I know you're behind the scenes there. Please, Olivia, who's our intern, will get your email and she will make sure that she connects to you to Marieke and everyone else. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much. And this is a perfect example of how we really do support each other on specific topics and we do our best to connect everyone. So I want to wish you all an amazing summer. I hope you all take the time to love yourselves, to love your family and friends, and to really pamper yourself and rejuvenate and come back in September strong to help us really amplify activists' voices. We will do our best as executive committee to rest as well and gather and think and see how we can help all of you. So everybody unmute yourselves, show us love, and let's say thank you so thank you margaret thank you thank you for all so the work thank you everyone thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye bye everyone bye thank you much waiting on girls thank you bye 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 bye